Uh, welcome everyone. This is uh, episode 12 now we're on, on the Unlaced podcast. So pretty excited for this one as um, I'd say we have a bit of a unique um, duo with us today in Sam Lane and, and David Gower. So guys, thank you so much for, for coming on and being a part of this. Pleasure, Jay. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, so um, maybe just to give a, a bit of background to some of the listeners of one of the reasons I came across Sam actually was on, on LinkedIn and a couple of weeks ago we had... Um, Chris Lawrence and, and Leon from One Wellbeing and also Craig Lambert come on the show and I think it might have been one of their posts where I saw Sammy speaking about some of the stuff, um, particularly around that what this podcast really emphasizes is, uh, emphasizes on is you know I guess athlete education and and also athlete transition and the common pitfalls and opportunities that athletes face, which uh, some of those words resonated. So I did want to reach out to you and just kind of see if we could have a discussion and we, we had a chat when was it last week and. About 20 minutes in, I'm like, mate, we need to stop this because I need you to talk about this on the podcast because <laughs> you're chewing out all the good stuff. So, um, yeah, thank you for coming on. And then, uh, as you suggested, you know, I thought learning a bit more about David, I understand why you felt he'd be a great um, asset to this discussion. And um, for those that don't know, David, uh, David Gow has recently retired, really, haven't you, from, from yeah, actually playing, playing across the NRL. So he's been. You know, played played over a hundred games for the Parramatta Eels, which is an incredible achievement for for any athlete. And had a couple of stints at West Tigers and Manly, and I think you had as a stint um, over in Salford, if I'm not correct. Yeah, right. funny, funny Salford, beautiful yeah. Manchester. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, more recently, I guess you've transitioned into a bit of Sam's uh, Sam's work of, I guess, the well being aspect of of some of the plays within the club and. Um, focusing on, I guess, the other side of the sport, um, which is really uh, impressive. But um, I think for, for maybe some of our listeners, Sam, it'd be good to maybe get a bit of background on you and, and what drew you into, I guess, um, some of your research and focuses of the work you're doing now. Yeah, sure. Um, bit of a windy road, sort of making my way into professional sport. Um, I guess, I, I suppose my, my professional career started in social work. That's where my, my sort of undergraduate background is in. And I worked, as, worked for a couple of years as, as a youth worker uh, across sort of South East Sydney. And then sort of a couple of years into, into practising there, I got uh, the Western Sydney University reached out and said that the, you know, the Paramount Reels were looking for a partnership. They wanted to co-sponsor some PhD research, I suppose, looking at athlete wellbeing. Um, you know, our club is it invests probably... I suppose more than most, um, and and really really trust hard to build an identity around um, not just caring for our athletes and, and our success on the field, but looking at successes that we can create off the field as well. And so, for me as a social worker, but as someone who um, has always had an interest in research, uh, has a little bit of background there as well. Uh, I guess my name was sort of thrown into the hat, and uh, at the time I was already working on a on a doctorate, which was all about young males and mental health, um, and I just kind of stumbled my way into sport and found myself here. And we're sort of two and a half years into that project, and um, yeah, now I'm working at ACPE, which is a sports college. We kind of run bachelor's degrees through a sports specific lens. Uh, but yeah, it's it's been it's been a brilliant ride over the last few years. I, I'd say I'm really I'm really still scratching the surface, and I'm kind of at the start of my journey here. Yeah. But I'm. But yeah, it's it's. I'm, I'm someone that's always, always had a passion for sport. That's always believed in in the, in the power of sport as being a vehicle for social change, and it's kind of cool to get behind the wheel and um and, and yeah, just make a contribution to to the good of sport. Yeah, it's it's, it's pretty unique. I went on your LinkedIn. I saw elite athlete wellbeing researcher, and I'm like, what the hell is that? <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm running with it. I'm like, mate, that is awesome because I'm like. I've never seen I've never seen a title like that, but what? How important is that? I mean, like, there's not enough there's not enough respect given to that kind of. Um, sure. Yeah, exactly right. Like, it's it's a perspective that I don't think's got a light on it um, enough. And I guess David, now what's the what's the the business unit you're in within Parramatta Eel? What's it called? Um, yes, yeah, so I'm the Elite Pathways Wellbeing Manager. Okay. So I look after the wellbeing programs for our 17s, 19s, uh, male and female program. For under 21s, uh, the reserve grade side, and also the career coach for the club. So I run across all those same teams plus the NRL and development this player in. Making sure there's a career plan, making sure our players are meaningfully engaged 
off the field because, you know, Sam knows too well, but there's a lot of studies around what meaningfully engagement, uh, mean, being meaningfully engaged will actually do for your career. Yeah, yeah. So th- you're probably working harder now than you did when you were playing. You've got well, you got more responsibility anyway. <laughs> yeah, so, that's uh, right. Well, it's funny. People say, oh, wow, well, you uh, stop playing now. You have more time with your family. I've got three young daughters and it's the opposite. You actually work harder than <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, less time. Those... Perspective, not physically, but obviously, you know, mentally and in other ways, you're working a lot harder. Yeah, I bet, and especially it's probably a, a bit of a new path. You know, I, I did actually want to speak to you about because I watched a, I guess, a bit of a clip of you recently, which you, I think, you were speaking of just your retirement, and you said something which I just wanted to try and click into a little bit deeper to see what that actually meant. Which was, I think, you said it, um, you're somewhat glad to be off the roller coaster. Uh, and I guess like when you speak from that, from a professional athlete point of view, can you give some insight into the listeners, like what that means? Cause I think I understand, but, um, maybe people don't fully get, they'll probably just see, oh, he's played a hundred games with the Parramatta Eels. How good's that? Um, but when you yeah. say roller coaster, what, what did you kind of mean by that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I've been in the game for 10 years. I've never been, um, a superstar athlete that's paid millions of dollars, multiple year contracts. So I've had years where it's sort of been October and I'm sort of wondering, you know, I'm not going to have a contract moving forward. Um, you're throwing that that I've, I've been dropped probably more than 100 times. Like, <laughs> so I've been in there squad for a lot. Like I've probably been, you know, in rugby league for 18th man. I've probably been 18th man close to 100 times. So I've been selected and not selected uh, uh, not, like, every other week. You know? So it's, it's been a, there's been highs and lows and ebbs and flows throughout my whole career. And, you know, the roller coaster is, is funny because a lot of the time, the week in rugby league, Monday through Friday at training is dictated heavily by the result from days earlier. So one, one week you've had a great win and, and the coach and everyone around the club's buzzing and everyone's in a good mood. And then, you know, you're throwing for us in 2018, we came last, we lost six straight. Yeah. So that's, um, you know, that was a really low point for the club and we never ultimately recovered from that position. We finished last, but. You know, for me personally, it was probably one of my best seasons in grade. Yeah. Which was strange. So I actually had a fantastic year. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's hard. Like the roller coaster analogy is sort of around, you know, the wins and loss column and, you know, the mood of the camp, individual players, coaches, and just forever changing. It's never a constant. Probably the most constant, which is strange to say, but is the preseason. Everyone's optimistic. Yeah. Everyone's happy within reason. Uh, we get hot out in Kellyville and, it's hard physically to train, but mentally, you know, you're just, you're just working hard to get fit and get ready for, you know, for the season ahead where, you know, there's probably 16 teams in the NRL comp. I think they're going to win the comp every December and January, you know, so. Yeah, there's not too much disappointment to deal with in preseason unless you're, you're injured, I guess. So, like, if you're training, you're, you're all optimistic you're going to play. It's actually something I, like, personally, I was challenged a bit with, and just for background for you, David, I played uh, in the A-League for about four years, um, and I stopped at around 21, 22. So I, I got a con- contract quite young to Gold Coast out of the AIS and then played there for a year and the club went bust. Um, it essentially just wasn't fit for purpose for the A-League. So the FFA chopped their license. And then I, I went down to Adelaide and I kind of was just in and out of the team every week. Like one week I'd play, I'd play if someone was injured. If I played well, but someone was coming fitter coming back, that was a bit more experience, they'd come in. So I was on this roller coaster, as you say, of just like, you know, in and out and coaches were changed. I think I had five coaches in three years and it was just like, oh, yeah, it was just crazy, you know? So um, I, I, we had a guest on last week, Ben Crocker, who's got a pretty inspiring story off the field. He just got delisted by Adelaide Crows, but he's, I think he's been in the AFL system for like five years and he probably notched up like 30, 40 games. So he literally just was always the 23rd or the 22nd man. Like he was so close to being in and out most weeks. And I was just speaking to him about like the mentality behind that and how difficult that must be because probably coming into it and, and I know your career was a bit bit of a, you, I guess a bit more of a late bloomer if you'd say like you, you sort of hit your straps a bit later on in your career. But for like people like Ben and even myself, like being elite junior athletes and kind of being the best in every team or captaining teams and then you get to the first grade kind of stuff and you, you're in and out and dealing with that disappointment. Uh, I guess he, he he was just, and I'm reiterating his words here, but he said he just found it really hard and he started like not getting anxiety, but he started like give, putting so much pressure on himself with certain areas to try and please coaches and get back into squads that has actually started to affect like his own just mental sanity. Like he'd coming in the club and overworking and 
just putting so much pressure on himself and there'd be blokes playing every week who were just so relaxed um, and confident in their abilities and, and getting games. So, I mean, how did, how did you deal with that mentally? And, and do you see players around the club now that, um, I guess, do you work with them in, in that sort of aspect as well to help them? Yeah, I think for me, you mentioned I was a late bloomer. I came in the grade off the, off the back of a solid foundation of, of work. So I was a qualified electrician. Right. Before coming in the grade. And I'd spent two years playing and living in the UK as well at Salford. So I had a bit of a better grounding, if that makes sense, than a lot of the junior athletes coming through, particularly in rugby league now. So, you know, I see our young guys who talk about being the big fish in the small pond and then, you know, jumping into the elite sports setting and you're now, you know, a very small fish in a, in a much bigger pond. And it's hard to take and, you know, the expectation for a lot of young athletes coming through is that I was an Aussie schoolboy, well, next year I'm full time, I play first grade consistently. Their pay goes like that, but their opportunities can go like that. And it's hard mentally to take. I mean, the expectation on them was to be a superstar within three years. Correct. Now, particularly from the club's perspective, you know, they're paid very well to be that superstar, but the reality isn't always there. And, you know, they're, it, it hits them really hard. And then mentally, they go on that journey of, well, I'm meant to be this superstar, but I'm nowhere near it. I don't understand what's happening. Then they play the blame game. And, yeah. You know, they start looking outwardly of reasons why instead of inwardly. And, yeah. You know, having that, that sort of hard conversation with themselves. So, you know, I talk about it and I've seen it through, uh, obviously, I'm 35 this year and I've had guys in our full time squad that are 18 years old. Yeah. We had a guy this year whose mum, he was very happy to tell me, was one year older than I am. <laughs> which, uh, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, it's not top right to hear. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I think um, a lot of our young kids coming through, our young and particularly men I'm, I'm referring to here, have a sense of entitlement when they come through. And yeah. in my role as, as the wellbeing programs manager at, um, at Parramatta now, I'm trying to make sure that our kids have a better grounding. They're more grateful for the opportunities they have instead of expectant. Yeah. And, um, you know, I really want, you know, our, our head of recruitment has talked about, you know, character must go on question now if you want to progress through the early ranks. And to me, that's fantastic. That's, that's what awesome. I've, been, I've been waiting to hear for years. Yeah. Uh, and he's including the wellbeing department in that. He's including communities, including coaches, obviously, every single aspect of the business to make sure that, A, we've got talented kids, but B, they're good people as well. Yeah. And I guess, you know, when I think about, someone asked me a few years ago when people um, talk about Parramatta, what would he want them to say post, you know, their time here? And for me, my goal would be that I'm a better person because of Parramatta. Mm-hmm. And that's maybe a bit idealistic, but that's my role now is to create better individuals because I believe better people make better athletes. Yeah, that, that's sort of where I'm coming from in that that sort of young young players. If I can reinforce that throughout the grade, well, the time they're an NRL player, they're grateful for the opportunity. They're not expectant of everything, and, and I'm hoping that they're going to be better around the people. I think that that's pretty unique and awesome. I I feel like. I don't know where the NRL's at with this. Uh, AFL, I've got a bit of visibi- visibility on, and like the player welfare is something that's growing in the AFL industry anyway, being based in Melbourne. So there's a lot of like emphasis on character building and like having, I guess, psychologists and the right people around to support players on and off the field with all sorts of problems, which I think oh. in soccer in this country is so far behind. But from just, just coming coming to, I guess, the business unit you're working in from a wellbeing perspective. And Sam, you probably have a bit of, bit of visibility in this with like some of your research and the, the amount of touch you've had with people across the country in sport. But is that a unique kind of business unit like within Australian sport right now, like having an actual, uh, you know, people like David there to help you like be prepared for life outside of sport? Yeah, I think that, I mean, the, the sector itself has been around for a lot longer than people probably imagine. In that mm. before we had wellbeing managers, we had career councils and career coaches who were doing a lot of this work informally anyway. So it's, I think that we're just uh, de- further developing and understanding why it's important to support athlete wellbeing. So from a research perspective and, and what my work is here to do is to answer that question. Why, why should we give a shit about, I guess, the off-field personal matters of our athletes? And secondly, you know, what good can come from engaging in that space? And 
really the answer to both of those questions is is the same. I mean, you've already alluded to the kind of pressures that exist for athletes, the highs and the lows. Um, for your friend Jay, you know, really struggling on a day-to-day basis coming into the club. You know, athletes are quite significantly overrepresented in mental illness. So anxiety, substance misuse, particularly during periods of transition out of the game. So one in five having intense distress during that period. So why is it important? Because well, sport has a duty of care. I mean, these are some of the some of the outcomes, um, some of the pressures that athletes experience. We need to have the right structures and systems to make sure that our athletes are safe, not just while they're in the game, but while they're coming through and coming out of the game as well. Yeah. So one of the reasons why it's important is because of mental health. The other reason is because, as you say, um, you know, better people make better athletes. And there's now growing evidence to suggest that, you know, the more engaged we are with athletes' well-being, um, you know, we can use that as a competitive edge almost. Um, and one of the big papers that have kind of come out of our space over the last few years was was trying to correlate uh, or find, um, understand the relationship between well-being and performance a little more. And so... Over a longitudinal study of three seasons that tracked 632 athletes, on average, athletes who were engaged in, you know, pre-retirement planning or, or, or off-field study or, or work away from sport, on average had longer careers, were selected by one club for a longer period of time um, and found themselves in more likely in leadership positions within their club. So... I think that as this space continues to grow, it starts to grow as we understand the kind of multi-dimensional benefits of, of athletes' well-being. And, and the other reason for our, for our, our organization, you know, I think it, it does start from a sense of duty and care and a genuine interest in and passion in, in the lives of our athletes. We're of course interested in taking a competitive edge wherever we can get one. The other one is that You know, sports are are not just competition, they're not just businesses, but, you know, they're here to serve their communities as well. Mm. We want to have really good ambassadors, uh, not just for the Eels, but for the Parramatta region. And so for us, taking that responsibility seriously means supporting our athletes to be the best people they can be in the sport and out of the sport as well. So, yeah, absolutely. Having a wellbeing manager is new for the elite sport environment. Um, but I think that in many ways we've been doing this work for a really long time. Yeah. But I think over the last 10 or 20 years we're starting to get the language uh, and we're starting to evidence the benefits of investing in this space. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, it's pretty cool. Uh, it's something that I, from my experience, I never saw. And now coming out of it and actually experiencing, I guess, the second phase of life after sport i could see the instrumental benefits of having a system like that around to to prepare because um i think you said this to me sam as well and it was i thought it was a really good way of putting it it's it's um it's it's not every day you get an opportunity to be a professional athlete let alone establish yourself as a player that can have a sustainable career for a long period of time like that's a minority um, like, you know, David Gale playing 100 games for the Eels is, is almost a bit of a min- minority to the amount of players that probably played for the Eels in the last 15 years, right? But everyone wants that path. Everyone wants to have that story. And it, when I think about it, and it's a little bit crazy. Now, I guess I'm fortunate I was young, so I kind of, as I've said before on the podcast, I could, like, try a lot of things, make some mistakes. I didn't really have pressure of, like, having family or loved ones who were relying on me. So I still had my independence to, to figure my own stuff out, although I had to do it alone with my close network. Um, but just like having having essentially players that want to be professional athletes, they've worked 10 to 15 years to get there and they've given daily trainings and you know whatever they've had to do, physio, mentally prepare themselves for games, for trainings, for, for a long period of time. And they've got to a professional environment and then that professional environment, I feel, and um, I always reference to guess what they say because I find it interesting the way they word it. And Archie Thompson was on a couple of weeks ago who was like a superstar from Melbourne Victory for, for the whole A-League. And he said there's just this, like, because he, he doesn't recognise himself now three years out of the game to the person he was in the league because he goes, there's just this certain mentality you have to have to be so clinical in that environment and to kind of be cutthroat, like not necessarily not be a good person, but you've just got to really sort of push yourself and 
tunnel vision on, on the sport at that time. And this comes back to my point of just trying to make where, you know, people train 10 to 15 years to be a pro athlete and then they're there and they're so consumed by it because I guess you're judged, as David will know, you're judged on your, your week-to-week performances. So you kind of live in that cycle. So to try and get someone or even yourself to broaden perspective on what's next, it can be challenging, especially if you're a young player. I mean, like, I'll, I'll be the first one to admit I couldn't give a shit about life after soccer when I was 18 to 20 because, you know, even a well-being manager like David, you know, could tell me you should start and I'd be like, yeah, but I'm going to be a soccer or I'm going to play, you know, NRL for Parramatta for the next 15 years, right? Um, and I, I always had that perspective, but I always just I find that interesting that we don't really – as athletes, we don't feel we need to give attention to other things outside of sport like we've given it to sport when we know our career is going to end. Um, so uh, do you guys have difficulty translating that message across to players or do you have an approach to that to kind of instill some confidence that you know you do need to have other areas outside of the game which will help sport, as Sam said as well? Yeah, so what we've been trying to do, and I've been preaching probably for a few years now, is everyone says, um, you know, my backup plan or my plan B is life after sport or whatever you want to call it. And at the Eels, we've consciously been calling it your second plan A. Because while calling it a plan B or your backup plan, you're deprioritizing the importance of it. And to your point about, um, you know, you only played soccer for the first few years, you know, four or five years, however long you end up playing for. The average career in the NRL is four and a half years in the, in the professional setting. 50% of NRL players play 60 games or less. 25% of NRL players across the history of the NRL play less than 10 games. Wow. So the chances of making the NRL are slim, but then actually maintaining a career in the NRL are slim. When you factor in the retirement age is currently 67, 68 years old, you got to you got to work for a long time, right? You're only an athlete for a very small, correct, really minute period of time in your life. So to deprioritize that other 40 or 50 years of your working career, your potential working career is, it's, uh, it's shameful to be honest. And that's the method that, that I try to reinforce now. And you now you talked about it didn't exist for you at the A-League. And like I said, I'm 35, 10 years ago when I first came into grade 25, well-being didn't look like it does now. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's no real excuse for athletes coming out of the NRL now to not be ready for transition. But that doesn't stop it from not happening. But even I think that this conversation is linked to the point you made earlier that there's this sense of entitlement, particularly with younger athletes. But sadly, you know, there is this kind of rhetoric that exists in this environment where if you're not committing 110% to giving yourself the best chance in sport, you'll never make it. Mm. But then at the same time, we're telling guys and and women to to be engaged with the sport, to have another career option, to invest away from sport. And these are completely contradictory messages it's, and they're really hard to find a fit. And I guess for us, being able to kind of leverage off, I don't know, say the research that I've just alluded to before and say, actually, this is good for you. This is good for your chances of making it in sport. This will help your performance anxiety. This will help you be more attractive um, it, as a character profile uh, when recruitment officers are making an assessment about whether you're someone they want to invest in. Mm. Uh, that might help us advocate around some of those issues, but you know, sport is full of those paradoxes. Oh, and it, contradictions. Is. it is, and that, that's a that's a funny one you mentioned because this is a bit of a funny story of a one of my best mates who's a professional soccer player in Korea, and he kept getting injured. He kept doing his calf, and he was he was a pivotal player, like an overseas import playing in the top Korean league, which is one of the best leagues in Asia, and he kept doing his calf muscle, and he because he couldn't really speak Korean and he was in a part of Korea where there weren't too many locals. So he spent so much time doing um, his his university degree in psychology. So he kind of essentially started taking that full time and he taught himself guitar. So he had all these things outside of sport to keep him sane. And the coach actually sat him down. This is a real life situation. This is kind of the paradox we're talking about. Coach sat him down and said, look, maybe you should give up education in guitar and focus on getting your body right. Like the plumbing the strings had something to do with his calf muscle tearing. And this is like, there, there's genuine, I think there's genuine fear for some athletes to, to really kind of promote that they're well-rounded and that they do other things outside of sport because maybe, and, and it's not to say that, you know, I'm hoping this is changing, but definitely I experienced it where the coach may see that as not a weakness, but a lack of focus to playing week to week. So do, do you find, David, even for you to have conversations with a coach um, 
you know, that it's important to have the coaches buy in on this as well. So players have that comfortability to, to try other things. Yeah, I think it's vitally important. If Obviously, leadership starts at the top and it filters its way down through the different stages through your leadership group. Obviously, your, your mid-range players and your junior kids, if the coach is saying one thing, that's going to influence all the way down through. And as if someone, in a, say, a Royal Being, is trying to influence something else, they're going to listen to the coach more, right, because they think that they're, they're tied to, to their coach's opinion on it. But I think we're lucky, and, and I'll just speak for Parramatta, that we see that importance. That's awesome. That off of engagement offers. I mean, we had Junior Paulo last year, had probably arguably his best year, and he, luckily for him, he played Origin this year, but he was asked in his end of season review 2019, why do you think he performed so well? And he said, without hesitation, it's because I was on a search rank carpentry in joinery. So wow. we've got plenty of stories like that, mm-hmm. which just reinforce that what we're doing from an education and wellbeing perspective is starting to pay dividends for our players. Mm. Yeah, I, I remember last season um, we just brought in a young guy who was um, a lot of hype, a lot of expectation on him. And pre-season he was, you know, suffering with some anxiety. And he went to our under-20s coach, who's also part of the wellbeing team, uh, and, and said to him, you know, I'm really struggling um, to get started and, and whatnot. And he said, look, you treat this like you've just popped your hammy. We're going to send you home for four weeks. We're going to link you in with a the psychologist, you need some time with your family. Fix yourself up when you come back and you're right to play. I'll pick you, just as I would if you'd, you know, done a muscle or whatever. That's and I just thought that was brilliant. And that, that was a reflection of our of that of the coach of that team being able to set a culture that destigmatized mental health to a point where our player felt comfortable to reach out for support from him. And it's almost with that, and I second that. That's that's a great story to echo to any coach because that almost drops the guard down of every other player too. to one, except they've got a teammate that's not doing well and the coach has gone, that's okay, mate. So then everyone else is kind of going to naturally have that reaction. But secondary, these, we wouldn't be the only one for sure. I mean, um, like, I, I don't know how much of the game and David, you probably, you've a lot more credible in sport than I have, but I can, can share, you know, pro- a lot more of the game of professional sport is played above the shoulders in the brain than it is with the body to an extent, right? And the body is kind of the vehicle that gets the hits and the burns and the, the cuts and bruises or whatever breaks. But really, it's that the brain that goes through so much and how you choose to react to situations is 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 really up to you. And I don't know if there's a, enough training in the, the professional athlete of like the mental side of the game because... Um, I actually sat down with a sports psychologist when I came out of soccer for just did a consultation, but she said something that stayed with me for a long time um, that, you know, humans in general, but definitely athletes invest so much into their physical body and physical activity, but how many actually invest into the mental side of it? And, and it just hit home to me. I'm like, I haven't spent a cent on anything around my mind around soccer, but it was my life every day. I lived at the AAS, didn't talk to anyone. Um, about anything I ever went through, I just held it in because I just thought that was normal. Um, so it's it's kind of cool that even at the junior level, you've got that acceptance within Parramatta for for blokes to to put their hand up and say, "You know, I'm not doing too well," and 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 have some people like yourselves to talk to that are raising awareness. And, and Sam, you actually, I wanted to talk about this podcast you sent me because um, I, I listened to it and um, I forget what what was it called. Is it under the cosh? Is the the name of the podcast. Oh, it's, it's, um, it's by The Guardian. Um, by The Guardian. Guardian. Right. Yeah, so, so they did, did a special on mental health recently. Yeah, so they did a special on mental health and what they were speaking about, the reason why it was so topical, not that it's not a topic of interest regardless, but a, a player from the Manchester City Academy got released um, and ended up committing suicide. And, and there was obviously some uh, reasons that probably came from like, you know, leaving the game and, and getting sort of released and having that disappointment and being alone that resulted in sort of that, you know, really sad, sad outcome. And they spoke about like, there's just, they had various athletes on there speaking about their experiences where they were sort of either close to doing something like that, or they just felt really vulnerable coming out of the game. So, I mean, from, from a, like what, what sort of prompted the Parramatta to really focus on this based, you know, when, when you hear stories like that and you look at there's just – I feel like there's inconsistencies around clubs in Australia with how we look at this and the touch points we have with players when they leave clubs like retiring or, or leaving with injury or going somewhere else to try something different. Um, so what I'd be interested to sort of see when did when did this kind of shift to become like, you know, this is really pivotal for this club to even get a competitive edge. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah he's been around a lot longer than I have. So yeah. I him. I think it's probably been the last few years. We had um, we had a guy, Jason Stewart, he's since just left the club, but he fought a good fight for years right. at our club for, for sort of, you know, the hierarchy to understand the importance of it. Um, and he was always talking about, to use your, you know, your gym reference there, he was talking about, you know, bringing in mindfulness and things like that, the importance of a mental edge type program, but players not seeing the benefit after they do it once or sort of riding it off after one or two sessions and yeah. sort of thinking it was a waste of time. He said, okay, well, how do you get stronger in the gym? Or I like, do weights every day. Okay, well, how much do you bench press? 120 kilos. Well, you're strong. You never have to bench again. No worry about it. <laughs> well, no, what do you mean? Of course I have to. Yeah. got to do it every session. I need to keep getting stronger. He goes, exactly right. Why do you think you're going to master mindfulness in one or two sessions? You've got to do reps. You've got to continually do it to get the benefits from it. And you know, analogies like that sort of hit home, but um, it's a work in progress, if I'm being brutally honest. Yeah, um, yeah. It is starting to gain great attraction, and we've still got a ways to go, and I think professional sports in general still have a fair way to go, and I think society at large as well has a long way to go. But I think the good thing is we're trending in the right direction. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Sam, I'd be interested in David. You're, I'm ha- happy for whoever take this, but I mean, just and this is a bit of a broad question, so excuse me for this. But I'm just keen to see your views on it. But what what do you find that are some of the like the most common challenges elite athletes face that probably the average sports fan or or listener on, onto this sort of podcast maybe would not really be aware of? Because we probably think right, and I just preface this like a, a challenge for an athlete is oh, a, a torn hamstring or like an injury, right? But but just want to get maybe a bit deeper on that perspective from your end and your expertise. Yeah, I can definitely contribute something from a research perspective. Um, but as I said to you, you know I'm not an athlete and that's why it's important that I drag Dave along today to, to give himself <laughs> a good and got yeah, the experience. Man. Look, I think that probably, and, and what attracted me to your podcast originally was was this idea of humanising athletes. You know, what we see from the outside is kind of the, the glamour of elite sport and I think that, the, the lay consumer would imagine that an athlete's life is is easy, is simple, is um, everything's handed over on a plate, everything's uh, opportunities are just constantly in flow in front of them. Mm. The reality of elite, of elite sport is that such a finite minority actually even get an opportunity, let, let alone be able to sustain a career in sport. Of those few that even do get to sustain a career in sport, you know, they're not only faced with, you know, a whole number of pressures that impact their mental health. And we talked about transitions out of sport, the kind of loss of identity that come from being let go from a club. It, it, you know, there's a lot of research that finds really clear parallels between athletes' experiences and military personnel leaving the army. You have to find and reconstruct a whole new identity around that. But I think for me as, as an academic and, and as a researcher as well, you know, I, I lecture at the moment at Australian College of Physical Education, which is a, a uni that Dave's actually got a degree from. Um, you know, our athletes, they don't have the same time to commit to their studies that our other students do. Their schedules are constantly changing. Mm. They're in incredibly physically demanding environments. They're expected to contribute to all sorts of community and commercial programs that the club run. Many have children. You know, actually it's it's really difficult for them to engage in mainstream education programs. And so, and that's probably something that the average person in the public would struggle to understand. You know, we say, well, you need to have another plan A and you need to have other options and you need to find other passions that you have for yourself. But there are a lot of challenges and a lot of barriers that actually get in the way of being able to succeed and achieve away from sport at the same time. I think for me, for our club, for my research um, and, and a project that I was lucky enough to do last year with Chris Lawrence and a few others um, looking at athletes' experiences of education, was about trying to find innovative strategies to some of these challenges. You know, how can we be flexible and cater to the unique needs of athletes in a way that sets them up for success away from sport rather than just creating more opportunities for failure? 
Um, and, and, and that's probably how I ended up in contact with you, Jack, was kind of getting some, some recognition for that research and being able to present at the AAS and get it published in an international journal. So, look, I think that we're all still figuring this out in many ways, but fortunately there's, there's a lot of momentum in the space. Yeah, I think that's such a great analogy to comparing. It may seem extreme to people listening to it, but I could not think of anything more correct without being in the military. But coming out of something that's so disciplined and structured um, and you've got so much support and you've got to play a role and you've got to turn up and be on every day, um, it's actually a really good... And there's there's a lot of statistics, I think, and I, without knowing them, but there's a lot of statistics in there. Um, in the states that that's kind of shared that the struggles of what people who come out of the military go through, like from a depression and mental health point of view, and it's really not too dissimilar to sport. I think I just don't think it's documented as much, or people are aware of it as much to kind of talk about. Wow. And this is why I'd be interested. I know David, you've done probably as good as anyone at transitioning into a role because you've kind of stayed within something you know, but you're in an area that you're passionate about, which it's pretty hard to do coming out of something that's consumed you for so long and to do it so quickly. And um, I always thought it was just me because I fell short of my professional goals that I struggled with transition um, because I was like, oh, there's still this burning desire that I should have done this and I wasn't prepared to change. I didn't allow time to go through it because I didn't want to come out, right? But a lot of people that I've started speaking to who have come out on their own terms after having long, successful careers are like, mate, it's no easier for us as it was for you. Like it's still the the change in structure, the change in discipline, like it's still fucking just as hard for me. Um, so I, I actually found that really interesting because I just thought it was me. <laughs> but even people who've had long successful careers like yourself, David, and, and maybe, you know, I'd be interested just to kind of hear your, and I know it's probably only been a short time, but just the other side of retirement now, like the perspective for you, even though you've gone into a full-time role, is it is it still a bit of a shock to the system? Yeah, it is a little bit. I mean... Historically, I always took two leading into the next season, but you know, this time I've taken six or seven weeks off, and, and physically, you start to feel it. Like my wife always, you know, spray, gives me a spray because I'll be rubbing my stomach if I'm having that extra bit of caramel slice or something. But you know, silly little things like that, where you know, you're used to being so active, you're used to like I used to stretch three, four times a day as an athlete, but I'm not stretching, so I'm a bit stiffer yeah. through my thoracic and my neck and things like that. Um, and then it's, yeah, the structure that you speak about. I was lucky that I was always identifying my pathway. I always, I, I'm a little bit unique, I'd like to think, but I was always thinking five years ahead. What does retirement look like? Yeah. What's the dollar figure I need to be able to provide my family? What is the education of that role specific to, to me need to happen to be there? So I was always acutely aware because I've seen friends retire before me that struggled. Yeah. with a loss of identity, lack of education, lack of job prospects that just sit there and then, you know, October 31 comes, the job stops, your contract finishes, what do you do? Um, so I guess I sort of learned from friends of mine and past experiences from other athletes that, that I knew I had to really position myself in a really specific way and that was fostering relationships and networks as well yeah. to make sure that I'm an asset I was an asset on the field as a player, but I was becoming an asset off the field as a person, most importantly, because yeah, I'm still only four weeks into transition, but it's still, like I joked earlier on um, with you about not seeing my family as much, but it's things like that. Like my kids don't understand. Yeah. Daddy, you're going to pick me up from school? No, sorry, darling, I can't. Yeah. When are you home, Dad? Well, I'm going to be home at dinner time. Yeah. Well, why? Well, what does that mean? And their whole life, they've only known me as an athlete. Right. The common misconception that you, you you train all day every day it's not factual right no. particularly in the season um whereas now every day i drop my daughters to school but i'm not there in the afternoon more often than not it, it's, so it's um you know for, for me that's been the most difficult thing in transition apart right. from trying to keep the body in shape but it's it's <laughs> missing my daughter in the afternoon and i've got a 12 week old baby as well and, and my wife having to sort of bath, feed, look after a seven, five and a 12 week old on her own when she's never had to do that. She's always had more support. Yeah, it's different now, right? Five of the six, or at least six of the seven days, you know? So, you know, things like that. And, and it may get more difficult when our boys start coming back and training every day. But, you know, I still, I'm lucky that we've got a gym here. I still duck in and do a workout every day because it makes me feel good. Yeah, that's um, awesome. So basic things like that, but. 
that yeah. just you just prompted it prompted a thought. Sorry, sorry, Sam, go ahead. I was just, did you flex your pecs when I said? <laughs> 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 I thought I saw that. I look, I don't know. David, I didn't know David well enough to call him out on that, but I definitely yeah. saw. I definitely saw that almost hit his cheekbone. Um, <laughs> um, no, but you did. You just prompted the thought, and this is, I think, is another reason why um, humanizing athletes and broadening perspective on why it's important to keep the brain stimulated outside of the field is because you, as much as Sam, you touched on, and it's a, such a perfect way of saying it, is like the the structure of or the. I guess the the schedule of the athlete changes week to week depending where they're playing interstate, here, trainings can be afternoon, morning, it depends on so many things. So you can't commit to anything. You've got to you've got to you're bound by that structure. If you're not available, you're not gonna play. So you know, the, myself and David when I was playing, we can't we can't have a group assignment at uni with four other people because we can't get to class. Like it's just not a normal option. But at the same time, we have so much downtime outside of training because even if you're doing double sessions, like they've one or two hours out of a 24 hour day. So you, there's so much downtime where you're not doing anything yet in that period, I always felt, and it depends how you are. Some people are different. Some people can really detach well, but some like for me, I always used to be thinking about the sport when I wasn't playing and I'd be recovering or stretching or mentally playing the game already. So I was just consuming so much into the sport and like I became so defined by it that my performance on the weekend would dictate how I was as a person through the week in a sense, which is like a really unhealthy trait. Yet I think it's very common in a lot of athletes. Um, So, I mean, like, and I'm not sort of saying you guys are are sort of working on this with players, but what David and and Sam would be interested to get your just perspective on this from, from if you've, if you've had any research, but what are some of the things you think are healthy for athletes to be doing in that downtime? Because, they, there's more downtime than they do than there is playing, right? So, like, how do you keep your brain consumed on on healthier habits so you're not wearing yourself out? I guess. Yeah, well, I think it'd be fascinating to hear from um, from Dave about how he sort of has um, managed his identity throughout his career. But I suppose what sits behind a lot of these issues, uh, from my observations, is what's really unique about sport is that you know a person's like personal life and professional life is completely synthesized into one identity. You know, it's not that you go home from work, you go to work, you go home, and then you sort of, you're a different person there. Mm. Athletes are athletes around the clock. Everything that you do is in leading to the weekend. You can't just kind of go to the shops. You're at the shops as an ambassador for your sport. Not only that, throughout the week, you, everything that you do is in preparation for the weekend, whether that's thinking about your diet, whether that's making sure that you're um, getting enough sleep, whether you're stretching enough, whether you're practising mindfulness, whatever it might be, everything leads into optimising your performance for the weekend. And I think, I suppose for us it's about, and for our wellbeing team, it's about understanding better ways to support our athletes through that process. You know, so for us it's been, you know, we've, we've run some kind of, experiential workshops which is about connecting our group because we know that when athletes arrive at our club for a lot of our young guys who are moving into state moving overseas they're replacing their entire support network their entire sense of self with their athletic identity correct so the people that they reach out to now are not family members they're well-being staff members yeah they don't have the same mates it's harder to stay in contact with their mates, so they replace that circle with their peers because they're in the same kind of hectic, chaotic, shifting circumstances. They understand the sacrifices that they need to make. They're equally as disciplined. And, and so for us, it's about create, making sure that that connection is strong and that that support network is, is going to be effective and catch athletes when they are struggling with some of the tensions and pressures that come yeah. uh, with putting your whole self into sport. Yeah. yeah. I was speaking to our CEO today actually about this, uh, that team connection piece that Sam's talking about. It's easy. The way I was able to keep myself, I suppose, not only as an athlete, well, they had my, my background as a tradesman. So I had a, not a life, but I had, you know, an identity before becoming an athlete. But yeah. having separate circles of friends as well. So my whole life wasn't consumed 
as a Parramatta Eel or as an NRL player because my, all my friends weren't NRL players. I had a group of school friends. I had a group of my semi-professional friends. I've got them, my wife's friends, their husbands. So I had three or four different networks of friends. They didn't give a shit that I was Dave Yow, the NRL player. They actually took the piss out of me because I was a footballer. Right. And that's refreshing, right? Like, it's, it's nice to have that different uh, conversations with, you know, my school friends that you don't have with the boys at the training. It's nice to have, you know, separate conversations again with my wife's husbands, uh, my wife's friends' husbands. Yep. So just having those differences around, I found really kept me grounded and ensured that I wasn't just the athlete. But like Sam touched on, it's hard for guys in Sydney because people come in our club from New Zealand or from Fiji or from, you know, we've got guys from interstate and all they have is each other. Yeah. And, and it becomes hard to not identify yourself as the NRL player when all you've got are NRL player mates. You know, it's everything associated with your life is NRL. And that's how that identity sort of really, you know, gains and sustains, I suppose. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> from the other side of the fence, I guess, is someone who, like, works for, with the staff. When I got offered the, the scholarship to come on board and do the research, I remembered saying to the wellbeing manager at the time, look, you know what, I'm not a, I'm not a footy fan. Like, oh, I've, I've watched a Paramount Eagles game probably my life. And he said, that's why you're the perfect, perfect candidate because we're not looking for a fan. I don't want you to talk to them about footy. I want you to get to know them away from footy. That's awesome. um, and, and so, and that's been true for me. I really, I really talked to the guys about, about what happened on the weekend. Oh. I'm more interested. In how the family's going and what's happening at work and whatever else. Yeah, that, I think that's so healthy. And D- David hit the nail on the head. When you have friends outside of sport where you can have some normality, it probably helps just to like take your mind off it naturally because um, yeah, when you're so consumed by the people around it, you're naturally, your head space is naturally going to just even, even though it's not thinking about performance, you're still in this kind of sport in a sense, aren't you? Because um you're so connected to it and this is one of the things that because i did struggle with identity loss i think my one of my mates actually sent me um a post like a couple years after i came out of the a-league and it was like someone read on a blog like where the hell is jake barkadesh and because i literally i just purposely went missing for two years like away from soccer i didn't want to be associated with it because being around it and not being where i was it was like torturous like i just couldn't accept that I came back to Melbourne to play in like our Premier League here, right? It was like uh, being there was, the more I played there, the more I felt like a failure rather than stepping away. I could kind of redefine and recreate something and I just went missing. But it it took me a couple of years to realise actually, despite maybe falling short of my professional goals, and this is why I think it's great what you guys are doing because you're challenging the athletes to understand that actually you guys are so gifted and talented as sports people, but what's got you gifted as sports people is really actually comes back to you as a human and the traits you have as people that are translatable to anywhere. You've just chosen NRL or you've just chosen rugby to, to show it now and that's going to be a vehicle for how, however long it can be. But the sooner you start to channel that into something else where you've got a bit of passion, you're going to be just as successful or if not better because you're, you're a competitive person. There's There's a lot of disciplines and traits that are, are really healthy for a lot of things and like i'm translating that now a little bit into the corporate world where you know that sort of it's kind of like a new sport to me but it's the mindset's a little it's still similar in a way there's there's not sort of a sporting performance but at the same time there's competition there's like you know there's structure um you know it's down to you what you get out of it little things like that um so i think like the, emphasizing that to athletes is is a bit of an eye-opener because that's what i learned i'm like actually all that stuff I did didn't go to waste. Like, because I used to play the victim. I used to be like, I gave so much to soccer and I got nothing back. But it gave me so much for anything else. So, is that, do you guys feel that that's something you try and instill in your athletes to be like, what you guys are doing is pretty unique, um, but it's going to set you up for, for a lot of things outside of your, your footy careers anyway? Yeah, I think I've, I've met with a lot of um, businesses and you know, group training organizations over the last month or so. and they're screaming out for athletes. Athletes are really desirable out there in corporate body. You're saying you're starting to come across that now. Yeah. And, you know, you talk about discipline, like competition, teamwork, all these basic things work ethic. But the one thing that really blew me away was the fact that athletes crave feedback, constantly crave feedback, yeah. good, bad, or different. Because yeah. what do we do every day? You go to training every day to get better, right? Correct. Always constantly finding 
one percent ways to get better because it, it's the difference between playing that week or not playing that week, mm. getting a contract or not getting a contract. So what I found just briefly and speaking to some of the, you know, the corporates just in my last few years as a player is that being an athlete is such a desirable feat. Just a lot of the time you just need that little bit of education behind you to justify gaining high level roles or whatever they may be. But the ability and the want and desire to constantly give, receive, understand that feedback's not personal, it's about making you better as a person is such a desirable trait. And I've only really realized that over the last probably month. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it really been ran home to me. And that's a message that I hadn't preached in the past, but now I'm really specific in my approach to our young players that Mate, you are very desirable. Places want you because you're constantly going to want to get better. Every day you're going to want to get better. Yeah. And, and I've been told from friends that work in corporate that they don't get much feedback. No, that's right. And it's funny, right, because when you think of the sporting environments and just say use Parramatta as an example because you preface like, yeah, the, the highs and lows, but like sporting, professional sporting environments are so highly emotional. And, and good and bad. I mean, it's, it's all the, the kind of, and it, it even like filters down to people like Sam who are, who are not directly playing, but they're involved in the club. But when the club's losing, like Sam feels the effect of like the culture and people are down and people unhappy because if you're out there promoting how happy you are and how good life is when your team's lost six on the trot, like you mentioned, everyone's be like, well, this guy doesn't take it seriously or, you know what I mean? So I think w what I'm trying to say is like, Athletes, they're so used to being in these high emotional environments. They're so used to copying criticism, praise, having really hard discussions like, you know, a coach telling them why they're not in their plans or, you know, having really hurtful things said to them by fans that when they come out of that and they go into like the corporate world and they're having feedback from a manager, it's it's really nothing good. It's, it's not that hard to, to receive because it's like, it, mate, it's the spray I copped at half time when the coach dragged me off is much worse than anything you could ever tell me. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. the, 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 these are things that I'm picking up, right? Because I was like, I see people that are scared for it because I'm a constant person that just wants feedback, even on this podcast. The first five I did, everyone's telling me how good it was. I'm like, that's not what I want to hear because it can't be that fucking good because I want someone to actually tell me. And then my dad finally said, oh, you, you know, he gave me some feedback. I'm like, thank you. Like, cause it, it's, it's only going to help it get better, but it came from sport. I mean, the, the, the feedback you can get from coaches and fans can be so brutal that, Really, after that, there's not too much that can really affect you the way that that does. I've been joking over the last little bit about that. The way we get spoken to by your coaches, <laughs> no way you'd be allowed to be spoken to like that outside of sport. No way. Yeah. Like, anything after that is going to be insignificant almost. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's exactly right. I've got, fair, oh, I've got the fair couple of solid sprays. <laughs> yeah, I can but, uh, I'm coming straight to mine. <laughs> yeah, it gives you some goosebumps, oh. right? There's some you can't trump. Oh, you <laughs> um, your uh, just, just I guess one to round out, I guess, um, just the episode. One of the, the things I wanted to ask, and this is particularly for, because on this podcast, we actually get a lot of younger athletes listening, which is awesome because trying, that's like the, the demographic because um, that I, I'm really trying to help because they're the ones that are going to go into this next phase and this next generation where the work you guys are doing is going to be more evolved and we're going to be in a better place to do it. And it's not to say that pro athletes um, who are there now aren't listening in and taking on the advice or listening to you guys and taking on the advice. I'm sure there are, but we're just attracting a lot of young audience. So what I wanted to ask, and this is for the both of you being in the, the sort of sector you are, but what are some of the, the, the good traits you look for early in individuals that join the club from the 17s or to the first grade team that you hope to see or one you try and instill to kind of give you some sort of confidence that this guy's going to be here for a long time or he's going to have a great career, but it's going to be a great human as well? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we've sort of alluded to this idea of transference uh, throughout our chat this whole episode that what you do on the field is going to benefit you away from sport, some of those traits like resilience, teamwork, discipline, all that kind of stuff. And what you do away from sport will, will impact your experience in sport as well. And Dave alluded to it earlier and said that now, you know, looking at character is an important criteria for our recruitment. So for me, as, you know, as someone who works, you know, independently within the world of ET, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for um, athletes who, who want to use their time in sport for the betterment of their communities. 
Now, the Eagles have a really great uh, relationship and, and history working with Giant Steps, which is a school that um, supports young people with autism. Uh, and we've had, what, 10, 11 athletes go through volunteering there and working there. Um, yeah, for me, I, I really, I really admire an athlete who wants to give back. Um, and, and sort of who's always able to, to sort of carry that growth mindset and that appreciation for time and sport, um, for the benefit of both their professional aspirations and their personal aspirations as well. Mm. Yeah, I mean, for me, I'll probably look for a little bit more basic than, than what Sammy's talking to, but I, I just want a kid that comes up and respects the the environment that he's in. I want him to be humble. I, I don't like arrogance. I think you need when you come up as a young player, you need to show high levels of humility. And also, I, I want to see kids that are grateful. If you're grateful for, for the opportunity you've got, I had to fight very hard to get my opportunity, so I don't like kids that take that for granted or... You know, probably don't do the things that they've been gifted an opportunity to do. So I want, yeah, I want kids that are grateful, show humility and, yeah, just respectful of, of those that have gone before them, the history of the club as well, and those that are around them. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great great point. I think um, if I if I look back on my time, some of those traits, I think, David, are, are really powerful because I, I probably got gifted everything possible. As, a, as like I made every rep team you could make. I was captaining every team. I got to the pro pro leagues and all of a sudden, not that I wasn't humble, I was always good around the club, but I, I just expected everything to be sort of fed. I didn't, I thought not necessarily the hard work stopped there, but I thought, why am I not playing now? Like I'm here, I should be playing. And I think that's a great point that being grateful for the opportunity is one thing and learning that, you know, you're still going to have to, you're probably going to have to work a lot harder to establish a career when you get there than before you get there, if that makes sense, right? So, um I think they're great points, and uh, I think anyone coming into the Parramatta Eels as a, as a young kid's probably got a not an excite not just an exciting footy club to be at, but obviously the the guys you the stuff you're instilling from a character point of view is only going to really make that place culturally you know a pretty awesome place to be too. So I hope to see this translate out into more sporting teams because I think it's a topic, as you said, Sam. You know, making them better humans off the field is probably going to help their performance on it too. Uh, and there's not maybe too much data you can show around that, but I think what you said earlier around some of the some of the guys that have a bit more balance and the longevity of their careers and they become leaders and they, they kind of have more successful periods, um, that really hits home to kind of the message we're, we're all trying to send, I guess, throughout this podcast and the work you guys are doing. So, um, Yeah, thanks, Jake. I really appreciate you saying that. And um, for me personally, you know, I think, I think research is able to make a contribution to to the development of this space, but really the people that will affect the most change will be athletes. And having advocates like yourself, like Dave, who are able to kind of mentor and coach younger athletes through that experience, I mean, you guys have lived it, that makes you the experts, and I think that that young athletes will listen to what you have to say. And as someone that shares your passion for this space, I really appreciate you kind of um, using your experience and sharing your own you know, vulnerabilities and um, and hardships for the benefit of others um, is really admirable. And, uh, yeah, I guess I just yeah, really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about it. No, nah, thank, thank you, mate. I really appreciate those words. And, and David, also thank you for coming on. I know you're, you're kind of in the thick of what we call athlete transition now, but I'd say you're, you're probably an example of someone who's stuck at a – and that hasn't hasn't been gifted anything but has earned everything and, and has stuck at a road where I think your perspective where you said, you know, you've always looked five years ahead is, is like excuse my French, but it's fucking unique. Like no one does that in the sporting world. And until that until they're about three or four years away from retirement, maybe they give it a thought. So to anyone that can kind of take that in and put that into their own world, even for outside of sports, pretty pretty healthy perspective to have. So appreciate you coming on as well, mate, and and giving us some of your feedback into the work you're doing now. No, thanks for having me. It's been fun. Awesome, guys. Well, th- appreciate you coming on. And, um, yeah, keep it, keep an eye out for Sam Lane, guys, doing some of his research and, and David for uh, building it, building a culture and supporting the future of the Parramatta Eels. Thanks, thanks so much. Cheers, mate. Thanks. Cheers, guys. Awesome.